This video introduces second order modelling by focusing on mass spring damper systems. So we're going to assume that students have already been through the introductory videos on modelling and first order modelling and therefore they understand basic analogies between different systems such as electrical and mechanical. Now these videos will extend the analogies briefly but the focus mostly is going to be on what happens if we have two dynamic elements in the system. So when we did first order models there was only ever one dynamic element in the system and we ended up with a first order differential equation. So now we're going to look at systems where there are two dynamic elements or two independent energy story devices and we're going to see what sort of models you end up with. We're going to start with a simple mechanical mass spring damper system which is one of the most classic systems you will see in textbooks. Now just a reminder of what we did when we looked at the first order models. Here we've got a mass damper system with just one energy storage device, that is the mass. And if we look at this figure in the top left, you'll see what we did is we said if the two systems are arranged in parallel, by which we mean they have the same displacement or velocity, and the force is distributed between them. So you'll see we've said the applied force is split into F1 plus F2. F2 drives the mass, F1 drives the damper. We add those together and we get a model a bit like this. So when you have a parallel system, the forces add. <coughs> we also looked at spring damper system in the first order models and you'll see we had the same sort of system going on here where you'll see the forces add we get F equals F1 plus F2 where in this case F2 is driving the damper and F1 is driving the spring and this gives us a simple first order model. So what happens then if we add more than two components? Well here's the sort of principle we've been looking at. We've said if components are arranged in parallel by which we mean they all share the same displacement so in essence they're fixed together. You can see I've got three components here and they've all got the same displacement and then what we're saying is the force that's applied is divided between those components. So what we end up with is this here F equals F1 plus F2 plus F3. Now you can of course extend this to numerous components but we're not going to do that. But what we're going to do is use this observation to look at mass spring damper systems. So what do you notice? We've got a damper up here, we've got a spring here, and we've got a mass here. And they have been arranged in parallel. So you'll see they've all got the same displacement x. They're essentially joined together. You can imagine it as being at a point here. And therefore the force applied is distributed between the three components. So what I can do now is write down the forces in each component and the force balance equation. So this is what we get. You'll see the force in the damper F1 equals B dx dt. The force in the spring F2 equals Kx. The force accelerating the mass F3 equals M d2x dt squared and the force balance F equals F1 plus F2 plus F3. Now what I can do next, hopefully it's fairly obvious, is I can take this F1 and put it in there, this F2, put it in there, this F3, put it in there, and this is what you get. F equals M d2x dt squared plus B dx dt plus Kx. In other words, a second order differential equation. And that's all there is to modelling a normal mass spring damper system. Now here's an example where you'll get a system a bit like this. This is a rather cheap looking mountain bike but you'll notice it has a sort of suspension unit which is in essence a spring and a damper and it also has one here in essence a spring and a damper. Now you can also argue as you'll notice up here in this cloud that tyres also essentially have a sort of spring spring in us and the damper, implicit. Now, suspension units are quite common. You'll see, obviously, you need them in cars, otherwise it would be rather uncomfortable. So we have the car wheel, 
and the car wheel tends to have a springiness and a damp, damper effect and also a mass. You'll then find there's an additional spring and damper connected between the wheel and the car body. And you might want to say, OK, this is a really common unit. It might be quite important for me to know how to go about modelling them. So here's an example. So what I've done is I've done a sketch which represents the suspension of a car with what's called classically a quarter car model because we're only looking at one wheel. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rep rep represent the springiness of the wheel with a spring here and I'll call that K2. The damping of the wheel with a damper here and we'll call that B2. And then there's the suspension unit between the wheel and the car, and we'll call that K1. And there's a damper unit, which is part of the suspension, and we'll call that B2. So this is roughly how you would represent the suspension of a car. Now, we'll represent the vertical movement of the car with Y, and we'll represent the vertical movement of the wheel with X, and we'll represent the vertical movement of the road, because no road is perfectly flat, with R. So what have I done here is I've basically completed my diagram so everything is marked. There's no unknowns. So what I want to do next is say, OK, how do I go about modelling this system? Well, the first thing that I'm going to do is look just at this top component here, which is the car mass. And I'm going to say, what are the forces involved here? Well, we've got the force in spring one which depends upon the extension of spring one and the extension depends upon the difference between the movement of the car and the movement of the wheel, which is y minus x. So you'll notice down here the force in the spring, k1 times y minus x. What about the force in the damper? Well, you'll see again, this depends on the relative movement of each end of the damper. So what do we get? b1 times dy dt minus dx dt. Now, those two forces, the force in the spring, the force in the damper, are what's um, pushing on the car mass. So that gives us the acceleration term. So that equation there basically gives us the force balance at these points here. Now, what about the wheel? If we look at the wheel, you'll see you've got a spring on each side and you've got a damper on each side. So what I can do, if I just get rid of these top circles so they don't get in my way, you can see the wheel has got a mass and an acceleration. There it is, mw d2x dt squared. We've got a damper operating on the wheel where the extension of the lower damper is x minus r. So the damper force is b2 times dx dt minus dr dt. We've got a spring operating on the wheel, basically the springiness of the wheel, and that's got a force K2x minus R. And we've also got the spring and the damper associated to the suspension unit. And so we end up with these two terms, B1 dy dt minus dx dt and K1y minus x. Now, if you're ever asking the question, oh, this is getting quite complicated and how do I know the signs are correct? A very easy way of checking for a system like this is that if you were to bring all of the x terms and put them on the same side as this double derivative, they should all add. They should all have pluses. And that's a simple trick just to make sure things are okay. Now, I'm not going to do any more with this model. This is simply here to show you how you can move on from a mass spring damper model to more general systems. So some remarks. As discussed in the videos on first order modelling, it's important to sketch a careful diagram and express the equations for each component precisely. And you'll have seen that on the previous slide. If you don't do that, you'll make a silly mistake. If both ends of the damper move, the force may be dependent on the relative velocity of each end, and that would certainly be the case with the suspension unit. However, and here's a warning, there are other types of damping such as friction, which depend only on the location. There isn't a relative velocity. For example, if you look at a tyre moving on the road, it depends solely on the speed along the road. 
And another point here is acceleration component is always independent of location. It's not dependent on a relative velocity of two points. If both ends of a spring move, then obviously the force in the spring will be dependent on the relative movement of each end. Now, this video is not looking at lots of different arrangements of mechanical systems, masses, springs and dampers, because there are too much, there's too much variety there. And really all we wanted to do was a simple second order system for this particular video and demonstrate the quarter car model so you know where things may go on if you really want to do that. Now, as part of the same argument, you'll see we've not really looked at series arrangements of second order systems. Again, because you'll see things start to get a lot more complicated and the variability in the number of examples you can come, with, come up with is quite high. So what we want to say is you should be confident in applying the simple principles that we've given in the videos on the first order and briefly in this video here and with those principles you should be able to tackle you know reasonable complexity systems with different arrangements a summary for this video is the thing that's most important is that you understand for the a classic mass spring damper system which is something like this where the mass the spring and the damper are arranged in parallel and all have the same um, displacement, then this is the model, this simple second order model. And this is the one you'll come across again and again and again. There are other arrangements, and we're just reminding you, please take care when you're modeling other arrangements to make sure you put in all these little details carefully, the individual forces, the individual displacements, and then you're unlikely to make a silly mistake.